Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am really glad to have the opportunity to talk to the planetary community today. Uh, I'm Lori Glaze. I'm the director for NASA's Planetary Science Division. And I'm joined today uh, by Steve Clark, who is the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration, and by Jake Bleacher, the Chief Scientist, uh, Chief Exploration Scientist in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate uh, at NASA headquarters. Um, before we begin, um, I'd like to take a moment just to thank LPI, uh, not only for streaming this event, uh, but for, for taking the bold step uh, that they did two weeks ago uh, to cancel LPSC. Um, it's clear today that that was the right decision to make, and I hope that by making that decision early, uh, all of you were able to make changes to your travel plans to accommodate uh, this uh, this disruption. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we at least have this opportunity to interact uh, through this online streaming forum. And uh, we look forward to providing you with information and hearing your questions. Uh, Doris Dow uh, is available to take questions and she'll be passing those along to me. And she's going to remind me here real quickly of her email address so I can read it out to you. Um, and uh, I'd also uh, want to, as we're getting started here, I want to give a quick shout out to the entire uh, Planetary Science Division staff. Uh, many of them are online listening right now, today, and I'm sure that they're all missing uh, going to LPSC as much as you do. Uh, they're all passionate about what they do uh, and what we do in planetary science, and they're working hard. Um, as we speak, to make sure that all of our missions and all of our programs are functioning, um, even now as we've all moved into a, a uh, almost entirely virtual uh, working mode. Um, I'd also like to take a moment uh, to acknowledge some of the new folks that have joined the uh, PSD leadership team over the last year since uh, the last LPSC. Um, in the fall, uh, Eric Ianson joined me as the uh, new Deputy Director for Planetary Science Division. Eric has spent many years uh, working uh, in the uh, Earth Science Division at NASA headquarters, uh, where he was their Associate Director for Flight, um, and I was very excited to bring him on board as, uh, as my Deputy back in the fall. Also, Joan Salute uh, has actually taken on a new position called Associate Director for Flight, the same position that Eric had back in Earth Science. We now have that position in Planetary. Joan is leading that effort. It's essentially uh, leading all of our flight programs um, except for Mars, which fall under the Mars Exploration Program. Just recently, uh, we made a change in our director for the RNA program. Um, Steven Reinhardt had stepped in on an acting role several months ago, and we just recently made a final selection, um, and Steven will be taking on that role permanently as the director for the RNA programs. And we've also brought Megan Thompson on in a permanent capacity as the deputy director for the research programs. M Megan, of course, has been doing a lot of work for RNA for many years uh, in data analysis. So we're, we're really happy to have her uh, joining us as that deputy. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, the uh, current uh, budget announcement that was just made recently for the 2021 proposed budget. This is uh, the strongest budget uh, we've seen uh, in recent NASA history. In fact, really even in, in a long part of NASA's history since the Apollo era. Uh, it's uh, a 12% over last year's request and, and really quite impressive to support the agency's efforts uh, to return uh, to the moon, to uh, go forward to the moon with the first woman and the next man, um, also in support of the gateway um, and future exploration of Mars. Uh, and it supports uh, key decadal priorities for us in planetary science, and most importantly, Mars Sample Return and Europa Clipper. The Science Mission Directorate's budget strategy, uh, when we put this all together, is to work hand in hand with human exploration. So we are uh, supporting the science that supports Artemis. Uh, we also are trying to implement a balanced and integrated science program, both within the divisions and across divisions, advancing compelling science priorities, uh, science programs with the highest that are uh, commensurate with the highest national priorities, and then we're executing innovative partnerships in order to achieve those science goals. So this is the uh, president's proposed budget uh, for FY21. You can see the column in the middle. To the far left is what was appropriated in 19. 
Uh, the next column is the president's request last year for fiscal 20. And then the third column is uh, what was enacted uh, back just before the holidays uh, for fiscal year 20. Um, keep in mind uh, that the 21 request is exactly that. It's a request and it's a proposal. Uh, Congress is going to consider what's in that FY21 column over the coming months. Uh, the information in the columns out to the right um, is notional. Um, all of that uh, is subject to a, a great deal of debate and change as we go forward. A couple of things I just want to draw your attention to uh, in these columns are under uh, the uh, FY20 and 21 for planetary science. Um, you'll see that the 21 request is uh, a little bit lower than what we currently have in FY20. But again, this is a proposal, so we'll see uh, how Congress deals with that as we go forward. Uh, there's still a lot of discussion to be had. One thing I do want to point out that's, a, I think, a strong positive of this budget, if you look under the planetary science research line for FY21, uh, there is a substantial increase there between the request and what was requested last year. We're very pleased with that, and hopefully that will be retained as we go forward through the, through the budget process. I mentioned that our individual budget was a little lower than what... Uh, we received this year, um, and actually the top line across all of SMD is also lower than what was uh, received this year, but this chart just shows the science mission directorate budgets where the blue is the budget request and the black is what was actually uh, appropriated, and you can see that uh, over the last several years we've been uh, receiving a lot of uh, very good support from Congress, and so at this point I think uh, we sit back and we'll have to to see how all this plays out as, as Congress starts uh, working on the FY21 budget. Within planetary science, um, just a couple of points I want to uh, highlight here as far as the 21 budget. Um, first off, uh, the uh, proposed budget uh, is looking to uh, uh, suggest that Congress consider allowing uh, Clipper to launch in 2024 on a commercial launch vehicle as opposed to the SLS as currently required by law. Um, also, I want to draw your attention to uh, the bullet here about small sat future opportunities. Uh, this is something that uh, I feel strongly about. We had great response to our simplex call the last go round, really great science ideas. And the, uh, the current funding line we had was pretty restricted for uh, the scale of missions we're trying to do in Simplex. So we're looking to grow that so that we have more capability in that line. Uh, we've also, I already mentioned the RNA increase. There's also, you'll notice in the, in the president's budget, um, a, a proposal to begin study of, of uh, an ice mapper for a Mars mission. Uh, this particular idea, this particular concept uh, is to provide additional um, uh, science at, at Mars through a, a radar system. It's intended to leverage uh, significant uh, international and commercial partnerships uh, to do uh, mapping of ice uh, below the surface and near the surface uh, of Mars, also providing additional communications uh, infrastructure at Mars, um, and as I said, uh, significantly le leveraging inter international and commercial partnership, helping to prepare for future human exploration. like to shift just a little bit. Um, all of that has been talking about the proposed 21 budget. This chart actually shows the appropriations for Planetary Science Division from 2012 through our current appropriation in 2020. And you can see that we were uh, pretty consistent between FY19 and FY20 in the total amount appropriated for Planetary Science Division. This is a good thing. Um, in fact, the, uh, the FY20 budget that was appropriated is about uh, $1.3 million more than the, the president's proposed for FY20. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, there were a lot of congressional interests that were included in the 20 budget. And after we've looked at all of those, uh, the amount that's left over for the rest of planetary um, is actually a bit short of, of what we would have liked to have seen. So we're in the process right now of... Uh, uh, having our operating plan, uh, it's been submitted to Congress, and uh, once we have that operating plan in place, we hope to make a few small adjustments uh, to where the money gets spent. The total amount is set, but we hope to make a few adjustments. Um, and once we have that information, we'll share that with the community as well. 
This is our current planetary fleet. Um, I get really excited every time I show this chart. Uh, we've got 25 missions on this chart, 13 in operations, and 12 in development with uh, launch dates uh, nominally between now and 2026. Um, it's, a, it's a really exciting time to be a planetary scientist and a really exciting time um, to, uh, to have all of these missions on the, on the plate as we go forward. Um, uh, just a couple of things to draw your attention to here. I wanted to talk for a quick moment about Viper, which is shown in the lunar window here, the lunar uh, little subsection. Uh, Viper uh, is a mission that uh, is building on a lot of the work that was done for Resource Prospector uh, by the Human Exploration uh, Mission Directorate. Um, and that work, of course, was uh, uh, shut down a couple years ago. And so SMD uh, took that activity and has been continuing efforts there and, and leveraging all the investments that were made in Resource Prospector. And uh, so this is now the Viper mission. It's a Viper rover. There are some additional requirements have been placed on this rover uh, to survive the lunar night. Um, but the activity is moving forward well. It's being managed by Ames Research Center with the rover itself being uh, built by Johnson Space Center. And they're coming along um, doing very well, working towards their preliminary design review later in this year with a planned launch in 2023. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that one briefly because I think that's one of the newest things on this chart that you may or may not have seen before. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of our opportunities in Planetary Science Division. Uh, first, a quick advertisement for our Planetary Science Advisory Committee. Uh, we are in the process of looking for some new members. We have some that are going to be rolling off and we're looking to add some more. This is a great opportunity to really bring your expertise uh, to uh, a committee that provides direct input to Planetary Science Division. Uh, we're looking for self-nominations. Um, the, the process is open until the end of March. Uh, the websites are, are the addresses down below where you can uh, email your information. Um, as part of the package, the information is here. We need your uh, name, phone number, uh, email address, a resume, and a professional bio. So please send that information if you're interested. We'd love to hear from you. So a quick update on some of our announcements of opportunity. I've spoken about Simplex before, our, our three uh, projects that are moving forward through phase AB right now. I get a lot of questions about when the next Simplex call will be. Um, as I stated several months ago, after we made the Simplex selections, we really are trying to push the envelope on these. So we want to learn a little bit from uh, what, uh, what's been going on with these current missions. Uh, and so they're all currently planning to go through their uh, confirmation through their PDR uh, later in the summer and early fall. And so at this point, uh, we uh, do not expect to release the next Simplex call um, any earlier than September. And again, that's a no earlier than date. It may still slip some more, but that is the, the current uh, best estimate of when we expect that AO to, to come out. Um, for New Frontiers 5, we're still working to a schedule for a fall 2022 release of New Frontiers 5. And uh, we just recently, for discovery, made our step one selections. Thomas Zerbuchen made uh, four phase A selections in discovery. Um, these are really exciting. They're all dynamic destinations, very exciting uh, destinations, um, all four of them. Um, there are uh, two for Venus, the Da Vinci Plus, led by Jim Garvin at, jo at Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, Ivo, which is the uh, uh, Io Volcano Observator, Observatory led by Alfred McEwen, University of Arizona. Veritas, a Venus orbiter mission uh, led by Sue Smrekar at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And Trident, a uh, mission to Triton, uh, to fly by Triton, a uh, mission led by Louise Proctor at LPI. Um, and I, I have to say that one of the things that gets me most excited about all four of these uh, potential missions is that uh, no matter what combination of missions are selected, uh, we are going to be uh, expanding the breadth and diversity of, uh, of the science that we're conducting in the solar system. So I, I, I'm really, really excited about all four of these concepts moving forward. Um, you'll notice that, we, that uh, Thomas selected four missions for phase A. Uh, in the AO, we had mentioned uh, the possibility of selecting up to five, and I wanted to speak about that for just a moment. Um, 
we are at the moment looking at budget considerations going forward. And everyone knows I want to pick two missions um, ultimately out of this is uh, probably as much or more than anyone, uh, but there are budget realities. Um, and so we're looking at that. And at this point, uh, it's not absolutely clear we'll be able to select two. Um, so we are, I didn't want to pick five for, uh, have Thomas pick five for phase A if there was a potential that we wouldn't be able to select two. But at the same time, I still really want to select two. And so we wanted to make sure we had a good selection, a good uh, group there, a good suite of uh, missions to choose from going forward. Um, and so this chart here is one that I wanted to just chat about for a minute. And this starts to speak to why there are some budget, um, budget realities uh, regarding uh, discovery missions. And uh, part of this gets back to the decadal survey was recommended uh, discovery launches every two years. That recommendation came uh, 10 years ago, back when uh, the discovery cap uh, was around 450, uh, 450 million dollars and included everything, launch vehicles, um, phase E, included everything. And so you can see towards the left end of this chart uh, where the blue is the A to D costs, orange is phase E, green is launch vehicle, these, uh, these missions, uh, you know, at that time, uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, were, were all contained within that, that smaller cost cap. And then what you see uh, between Grail and Insight is that the launch vehicle costs were removed from the cost cap, but the cost cap wasn't reduced by that amount. The PIs were still allowed to, uh, to propose up to the same amount, which allowed more science to be included. Uh, in the proposed missions. That was the right thing to do. The launch vehicles had uh, costs that were out of the PI's control, so I still believe that was the right thing to do. And then again, between Insight and Lucy and Psyche, uh, Phase E was then removed from the, from the cost cap, which again then allowed more science to be uh, fit into the discovery uh, line, the dis discovery missions. I still believe those are all the right decisions to make. I think leveling the playing field between uh, missions with short phase E and long phase E is the right thing to do. Um, and we've got some great missions to show uh, that wouldn't have been able to fit uh, within the, the other kind of constraints from, from before. But the reality is that as you look at Lucy and Psyche, we now have uh, discovery missions that are getting pretty close to a billion dollars in their total life cycle cost. And so in thinking about uh, how frequently we want to launch discovery missions, we have to realize that um, something's got to give. We can, we can either increase the, the amount of money for each mission and spread them out, or we can reduce the costs and, and launch them more frequently. So this is just something that I'd like to put into the uh, community for some discussion as we're going into decadal survey. Right now, I think this is going to be an important topic for us all to be considering as we try to think about the sizes of missions and the cadences that we'd like to see launch as we go forward. Looking ahead, I want to talk about a couple of things here. Uh, I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about our assessment groups or analysis groups, the AGs. Um, hopefully, most people uh, in our community are actively involved in at least one of our AGs. I know many people are involved in multiple AGs. Um, these are really important community-based groups uh, that are able to pull together their individual science constituencies to best understand the real problems and questions that need to be answered, the scientific issues that are out there that need to be addressed. Um, and I really appreciate all the work that gets done by the AGs. Several years ago, uh, the AG chairs who used to serve on the Planetary Science Subcommittee uh, were essentially taken out of that uh, advisory committee structure um, as this, the structure was uh, kind of reorganized. Um, and I felt that uh, the AGs have kind of, they're still been out there, they're still doing great work, but we've kind of lost the way to really formally get uh, feedback from those AGs. And so I wanted to work to formalize that a little more. And so we're working, working right now uh, with the community and with the individual AGs, trying to make, uh, number one, the terms of reference more consistent so that each of the AGs are, are being dealt with the same way. And they still have some flexibility to reflect the needs of their individual communities but that we have some consistency in how they interact with headquarters. We're also trying to find a way to provide more consistent funding to support the ag chairs. It's a lot of work um, to organize a steering committee and to prepare for meetings 
um, and all the other workshops and activities that the ags put together um, so we're trying to provide a way that's consistent again across all of the ags to provide that support uh, for the chairs and for uh, the other activities that they conduct and we're also trying to as i said at the beginning provide a clear path for feedback um, so that the ags can not only provide information directly to planetary science division but also through the uh, planetary advisory committee so there's a formal mechanism for bringing feedback to headquarters. Uh, we've been working on this really hard. All of the uh, ag liaisons at headquarters uh, have been getting together weekly or bi-weekly to discuss this and to come up with the, the format for this. Uh, and we hope to have uh, the new uh, kind of structure in place by June. For you as a community, uh, hopefully this will be completely transparent to you, um, but hopefully it will also be a welcome change to the uh, to the ag chairs um, and those uh, steering committees. So look for that to come in the near future. Uh, one of the big things, of course, this year is we're all gearing up and planning for the decadal survey. Um, I encourage you all to go check the National Academy's website uh, that's given here. Uh, there's lots of good information there on the decadal survey. Uh, the white paper process uh, is starting to get underway. I'm hopeful that the website to receive all of the white papers will be open soon. Uh, hopefully by the end of March, but certainly in the next few weeks. And I encourage you all, I know you've all been working already to start putting together your white papers and collaborating with others in the community on those white papers. Um, the AGS each have websites where they're trying to bring members of the community together. Um, and LPI also has a website uh, for folks to try and uh, connect uh, with other like-minded individuals to put together uh, the white papers. Uh, information on specifications for those white papers can be found um, also on the Academy's website. Um, there, are, We had several, uh, we thought, really good activities <laughs> planned associated around the decadal survey that were going to take place at LPSC. Uh, so without LPSC here, uh, we're trying to find other ways to make these happen. Uh, one of these was an early career workshop. Uh, it was a two-hour event to be held on Sunday this last week uh, to help uh, uh, involve and engage the early career community. You know, what is a decadal survey and how can I get involved? Um, that activity is being postponed. We're in the process of, of trying to identify when and how we're going to, uh, to do that, so stay tuned. Uh, we have, of course, planetary mission concepts. We have 11 concepts that are under study right now, and there was to be an all-day a status workshop also on Sunday. We're working on postponing that. Um, given the situation, it may likely be virtual, but we're looking at something uh, in about the late April or, or perhaps a little beyond that. Uh, but uh, again, another opportunity for the community to hear what those different concepts are, to provide your input and engage in conversation about what those concepts uh, look like as they begin writing up their reports to provide to the decadal survey. Um, and then <clears throat> there was also to be an LPSC town hall led by the National Academies uh, to talk about the decadal survey process. We held that on Monday of this week. So I hope that some of you got to tune in to that earlier this week. This is the notional timeline for the survey. Some dates and uh, things you can put in your mind for where we're going here. Uh, 2019 shows some of the things that we did uh, leading up uh, to the end of the year. Um, just in January of this year, uh, NASA and the National Academies and actually NSF as well, all came to agreement on the statement of task. I encourage you to go look at the National Academies website. The full statement of task is posted there along with the guidelines and considerations. Um, there's lots of information there, so I encourage you to go look at that. But that's been agreed to, and now that that's agreed to, we're in the process of completing the procurement activity, which will get funding to the academies to allow the, the, whole, the whole survey to get kicked off. Um, as I already mentioned, white papers uh, submission should begin soon. Hopefully the chair will also be announced soon. Um, we expect the white papers to be due um, no earlier than late May, but it may be a little later in the summer. It's dependent on when the steering committee uh, has their first meeting. So stay tuned for more details there. Uh, then the schedule going forward would be to have a draft of the report in the fall of 2021, aiming to have the final report done uh, in the spring of 2020. 
There have been a lot of questions about uh, what constitutes uh, conflict of interest and who in the community, uh, if you're working on white papers, are you allowed to serve on the decadal survey panel? Um, Michael New and uh, Colleen Hartman and National Academies uh, worked very, very hard to come up with this statement. And there was a lot of back and forth and we really were trying to um, include, be as inclusive as we possibly could of, uh, of our scientific community uh, for participation on the panel. Um, but ultimately, this is uh, the statement, the conflict of interest statement that uh, we were able to uh, come to agreement on. Um, and there are some limitations, um, but these are um, intended to preserve um, the integrity of the, of the process itself. Uh, National Academies uh, puts a lot of effort into making sure that uh, the, the reports that come out uh, are, have, have integrity. Um, and so they are looking for and looking for, okay, I was talking about uh, nominees for the decadal survey, uh, be broad thinkers and open-minded um, and able to participate uh, preferably in person. Of course, that may uh, be subject to change considering uh, where we are, let's see where things are this summer. Um, these are the additional considerations. Um, authors of science-focused white papers uh, prepared for the survey are eligible to serve on any of the panels, including the steering group. If you're the first author on a mission-focused white paper um, that's prepared for the survey, um, those first authors will not be allowed to serve on the steering group or any panel that's considering that mission, but are allowed to serve on any other panels as part of the, of the survey. Further, the principal investigators of the PMCS, the NASA-funded uh, decadal missions concept studies, uh, again, have similar concerns as far as uh, not being allowed to serve on the steering committee or the panels considering that mission, but they can serve on any of the other panels. And uh, as I said, this was uh, essentially where we come to agreement on, on where we are trying to be as inclusive as possible of our community. Last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, our efforts within Science Mission Directorate to help prepare the next generation of principal investigators uh, that are gonna be leading the, the missions going into the, into the future. Uh, this is a, uh, an activity that was kicked off in November called uh, PI Launchpad. We held the first PI Launchpad in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, it was uh, competitive to take part in this. It was a very competitive uh, process. Ultimately, 40 participants, approximately 40 were selected. I believe that approximately half of those were from planetary science communities, so we're very proud of our participation. Um, it was, uh, from all accounts, extremely successful, and we hope to uh, launch the next PI Launchpad uh, in the summer. Uh, we'll see how things progress uh, right now, but uh, please stay tuned for that if this is something you're interested in. Uh, we certainly hope to um, engage more of the community. With that, I am going to stop talking, and I'm going to hand it over to Steve and then to Jake, and we'll all take questions afterward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lori. All right, so I am uh, the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration. Um, I believe a lot of you know me uh, last time I spoke at LPSC. And as Lori mentioned in the beginning here, it was all three of us were looking forward to conducting this in person, of course. Um, but we've got a good backup plan here and I see questions are coming in. So I guess we'll, we'll hit those questions after I finish. And, and Jake has a couple of slides as well at the end. So next slide, please. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. So I wanted to give you a little update. Uh, last time I spoke to you, um, my office was very lean. I believe there were maybe three of us at the time, a program scientist, a program exec, and uh, uh, me. Um, since then, we've we put together more of a structure to my office, and I'll draw your attention to the, the name change. Um, based on the activities that my office is involved with, uh, we have now identified the office as the Exploration Science Strategy and Integration Office uh, because the two key things we do is develop the science strategy, not only in SMD and across the divisions, but also with our cross-directorate colleagues such as Jake and our Space Technology Mission Directorate colleagues. And then we do the integration function. Um, 
working again across the SMD science divisions um, with the mission directorates, but also with our international partners and uh, other agencies as well that are interested in uh, working with us, particularly in the Lunar Discovery and Exploration Program. And so you'll see below the blue box that says LDEP, those are the various elements that are included in the LDEP program. Of particular interest, of course, is CLIPS on the far left, um, then the lunar instrument development to develop those instruments that will fly on the CLIPS missions, um, small sats, cube sats. Uh, we're excited about Trailblazer that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, we released an RFI to gain insight into potential lunar surface science mobility systems that we may be able to pursue in the future. Um, Viper, uh, Lori described, um, is under development and management by Planetary. Um, the Viper review team, which is an independent review team, um, remains uh, organized and funded under my office. And then uh, long duration lunar rover investments we're looking at, uh, the LRO mission operations is under um, my office. And then the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis as well. The orange boxes above LDEP are the activities that are above and beyond LDEP. You'll, I won't go into detail now uh, to preserve some time for Jake and Q&A. But uh, the takeaway there is we have a lot of engagement with the mission directorates um, and other international and government agencies as well, working through policies, um, um, working groups and so forth that really bring that integration part of the office together. Next slide. So talking about CLIPS, um, last I spoke to you, um, we had nine providers in the CLIPS pool. The circles show the five additional companies that we on-ramped um, late November, early December of last year. Um, Sierra Nevada Corporation, SpaceX, Tyvek, Blue Origin, and Ceres Robotics. And that on-ramp uh, brought these companies on to provide enhanced lander capabilities uh, to really increase the uh, variability and diversity of the providers in the CLIPS pool. Um, Viper is certainly one that we're going to be flying on a future CLIPS mission. In fact, the task order is out and proposals are due back from our providers uh, in mid-April. So we'll be looking to award that delivery task order uh, in late May, early part of June. Um, so uh, this is an update to our CLIPS uh, pool. And so now we have 14 providers that can bid on our task orders. Next slide. So here's a quick summary of where we're at with the procurements. Um, task order two is the already awarded delivery task order that Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines won, and they are developing their lander systems now. Um, and you'll see in parens that uh, Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines will be taking um, the NASA provided lunar payloads and some um, human exploration operations and space technology mission directorate technology demonstration payloads. I'll show that on the next slide. Um, task order 19C, uh, we're getting close to awarding, and that will be the next delivery to take a set of the lunar surface instrument and technology payload instruments that are in development now. Um, they'll also be taking uh, some duplicate NASA provided lunar payloads um, that we've asked to be developed in line with the first elements up above. I mentioned the Viper task order that we'll be um, awarding here soon. And then the second task order that will be released this year for what I'll call the more standard commercial services will be released um, roughly in the June, July timeframe. So next slide. So this is the delivery manifests, um, how they exist for Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines. Again, I won't go into detail here, but you'll see by the color code that the, um, the light green uh, indicate the science instruments that are flying on each of these uh, CLIPS providers. The orangish yellow box are the technology demonstration payloads. Then the blue box are the ones that have a really a good cross section between science, technology, and exploration goals. Um, so you'll see the uh, one on the astrobotics lander and two on the intuitive machines. 
And then the maroon or red box um, is what the Human Exploration and Space Technology Mission Directorate folks um, are very interested in flying um, that involve the navigation Doppler LiDAR, which will help inform future lander designs, including the human lander system. And then over there on the intuitive machines, the radio frequency mass gauge is something that we've asked to be put into the propulsion system at intuitive machines to enable us to get the uh, propulsion data. Uh, and this, in fact, will be our first data buy with our CLIPS providers because Intuitive Machines has a LOX methane propulsion system. And our space technology mission director colleagues are very interested in gaining more insight into that system. Next slide. So our next instrument call is called PRISM. I think a lot of you have probably been uh, informed of this through Dr. Brad Bailey and Dr. Ben Bussey. Dr. Sarah Noble have talked about this in various forums. Um, PRISM stands for Payloads and Research Investigations on the Surface of the Moon. Um, this is a two-stage approach that we are taking uh, where we will release an RFI to um, gain interest from the community of what type of instruments they would like to fly um, to the lunar surface. Um, and this isn't just planetary science, this really goes across all the science divisions. Um, and then the stage two part of this will be NRA solicitations um, that'll state the location for each delivery. Um, once we have that catalog of instruments and ideas from the RFI, we'll be able to basically start forming up where the community would like to go and we expect many different locations. So what we want to do is have the PIs propose science that are optimized for those locations. And so we'll go out with stage two solicitations to go to the various locations and then build the manifest um, for those future CLIPS missions. Um, the initial priority again is to solicit suites of instruments that can work together, uh, but we'll certainly welcome high value location agnostic instruments. Um, and as I mentioned, these PRISM instruments will feed the manifests from 2023 onwards. So our intent here was to continue to build the pipeline of, of instruments to fly on the CLIPS missions to maintain the cadence of two deliveries per year. And um, we do expect to have participating scientist programs for each of these flights. Um, Lori and I will work together on how best to put those um, participating scientist programs out uh, for people to uh, propose to. And then um, the future PRISM calls will ask for destination agnostic and standalone instruments as well, because what we wanna do is not just put suites of instruments together. We know there are some instruments that would operate by themselves or even a network of, sci uh, of instruments such as um, seismometers that we would like to put out on multiple landers to get multiple data points. Next slide. And click one more time. Thank you. So you probably saw in the news just recently that uh, we selected the first science instruments to be uh, going on Gateway um, in the early part of the Gateway buildup. Um, and we're excited about this, that science is going with Gateway from the very beginning. Um, I won't go into a lot of details with the words here, uh, but basically there are two packages uh, one that is being led by our heliophysics division and the other being provided by our European Space Agency colleagues. Um, and the major science objectives here really is to provide space weather and radiation measurements um, in a beyond low Earth orbit environment. Um, and certainly these long term objectives include predictive techniques that can be used for protection of our human explorers going beyond LEO. Um, we're gonna need to better understand the environment in the near rectilinear halo orbit that Gateway will be flying in. Um, we need to understand the environment on the surface of the moon. But then looking longer term, we need to understand the environment going to Mars and at Mars to protect our crews um, from the various uh, space weather hazards that we know exist today. Um, what's also interesting is we're gonna be flying through the Earth's radiation belt so we'll be gaining more insight into the environment. Um, we've gained a lot, a lot of information from the Van Allen probes. Uh, and of course we were 
sorry to see that that had to be uh, decommissioned because basically they ran out of fuel, but provided a significant science data for many years. So now we're going to be gaining more information beyond the radiation belts as we uh, embark on deep space exploration with humans. Next slide. So I've talked a lot about the strategy here and um, the science strategy at the moon, we're working very closely with Jake and the human exploration folks. Um, as in a lot, I'm stating a lot of what you already know, but the moon really is a cornerstone for solar system science. Um, it's a natural laboratory to study planetary processes and evolution. And really it's a new platform from which we can observe the universe. There's a lot of interest in uh, putting for instance, radio array telescopes on the far side of the moon where it's radio quiet, uh, where we can observe the universe. Um, we wanna understand the volatile cycles on the moon, um, study the impact history, uh, because that will tell us really more about the earth because of the earth moon system evolving at the same time. And certainly there's a, it's a, the moon is a record of the ancient sun. Basically, we would be able to better understand um, how the sun um, was emanating um, uh, uh, high energy particles at that time. Um, as we dig into the regolith and study that, we'll have a better idea of what the ancient sun was like uh, millions of years ago. We're conducting um, scientific exploration with humans and crew, uh, robotics together. Um, in fact, I'll draw your attention to the very last bullet. We had a joint um, SMD, HEO, STMD workshop scheduled for the end of April in Denver to start planning the science activities that our human explorers will do on the surface of the moon, starting with the 2024 mission. Unfortunately, we had to postpone that, of course, just like everything else with um, the coronavirus. Um, but we are looking at potentially holding virtual um, town halls such as this or subgroup meetings to keep moving those efforts forward because we really do need to start investing in the science instruments tools, particularly for the first human mission in 2024. And next slide. I think, yeah, my portion's done and I'll turn it over to Jake Bleacher to give us an overview from the Artemis uh, perspective. Jake. Uh, so I just wanted to say uh, thanks to Lori and Steve for the opportunity to, uh, to participate again uh, in this panel. Uh, it's a good opportunity to communicate uh, with everyone what's going on inside human exploration uh, and i think one of the main messages that uh, steve's already given a little bit here is that uh, as we look forward to human exploration moving beyond low earth orbit uh, science and exploration really go hand in hand uh, moving forward and so we'll be going on to the moon and at the moon we'll be c conducting scientific research much of it which will give us the foundational data that helps us understand how to survive beyond low Earth orbit and prepare for and eventually go on to send humans to explore Mars. Next slide, please. And so this activity really is multi-directorate um, and it, it really is an exciting time to be, uh, to be conducting this research. Uh, we talk about Artemis. Artemis is the program that we're setting up to uh, conduct the lunar exploration. Uh, and we talk about phase one and phase two uh, in general, just so we're all on the same page, in our mind, phase one is referring to everything we need to do to get ready for that first human landing on the moon. Uh, beyond that, we call that phase two. That's sustainable presence on the lunar surface and preparing for and learning how to move onward to explore Mars. Uh, an important point, I think, especially for this community to understand is that the exploration of the moon is not starting today. Um, we follow in the footsteps of many missions, Apollo, literally their footsteps. Uh, but up in the top left corner there, you see the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, I've heard many of my colleagues say, you know, the efforts were, that are underway now started a little over 10 years ago as we started collecting the reconnaissance data that's gonna help us decide where to send humans and what they're gonna do when they get there. Uh, working hand in hand with SMD, we have uh, a whole series of uh, missions intended to test out the human rated vehicles that will uh, get our humans to the surface, uh, as well as landing vehicles on the surface of the moon in prep for, uh, for when the, the crew will join them there. 
And so Steve talked about the CLIPS missions, uh, the CLIPS landings that will start delivering payloads in the polar region as well as elsewhere uh, around the moon. Again, starting to collect that data that helps us understand the, the lunar environment. Uh, and then human exploration and uh, space technology mission director will be looking into uh, using CLIPS as well to get some of the hardware there that we need to support the crew uh, for that first mission. Meanwhile, we'll be testing out through Artemis 1 and 2, the Orion spacecraft, uh, that will be the, uh, the lifeboat for our crew that gets us out into lunar orbits from which we can send them down to the surface of the moon. At the same time, we'll be building up the gateway uh, through several key launches, getting the key elements up there that are needed to, uh, to enable us to move forward and, and support that sustained human presence on the lunar surface. So this is, uh, we refer to this as a swoosh chart. We all tend to show it from time to time and it, it really tries to tie human landing system uh, call went out uh, last end of last year and we're in the review process for that now. And um, I know many of you have expressed to us a uh, desire to know when that announcement's gonna come out and I'll continue to say the same thing. We're getting closer. Uh, we haven't quite made that announcement yet. Uh, but it turns out as when you're trying to put in contracts in place that are going to carry your friends uh, to lunar orbit and down to the surface of the moon, uh, you know, you want to get it right. So we're making sure we get that right. We're taking our time to, to make sure we get that right with our commercial partners. Ultimately, this process uh, is uh, initially our American-led uh, establishment of a strategic presence around the moon. But ultimately, it, it offers an unbound potential for partnership and collaboration as we explore the moon, prepare for exploring Mars. Uh, this slide here just gives us a quick sampling of some of the key capabilities that we're looking at to help explore the moon, again, and think about as we move forward into Mars exploration. Uh, Steve mentioned uh, SMD uh, put out a call for some mobility capabilities on the, on the lunar surface. Uh, that was a joint request for information, RFI, with, uh, with HEOMD. We put out a separate call, but jointly with SMD, uh, to look at an unpressurized roving vehicle. Uh, we call it the uh, Lunar Terrain Vehicle, LTV. Uh, that call went out a few weeks ago, and we got uh, over 30 responses back from commercial and, and also university um, uh, areas. And so we're in the process of reviewing those uh, reports and looking at that for some uh, novel new ideas that might help us explore the lunar surface um, and understanding uh, what capabilities that the commercial sector can bring forward to us. Uh, with respect to suits, uh, we have an in-house build to meet our initial landing on the lunar surface, uh, but that's likely also to be uh, competed in the commercial um, realm as well. As we think about what do we need those suits to do for our sustained longer term presence on the moon? Uh, again, we have the, the systems that are being explored now for maintaining our orbit and um, for the lunar outpost, the gateway, as well as the systems that will take us to the surface and uh, bring crew member uh, back up to, to orbit. Um, what I think is really important to highlight here, though, is um, the coordination that's uh, now going on between the directorates. And I think both Lori and Steve mentioned interactions with human exploration. Uh, I also want to call out our Space Technology Mission Directorate. Uh, in addition to the collaborations we have between SMD and HEOMD, uh, working closely with STMD on their Lunar Surface Innovation uh, Consortium, which they uh, newly developed, which is a, a chance to engage the uh, public community. Uh, thinking about what technologies do, are we going to need in place on the lunar surface to support these, uh, these grand endeavors that we're talking about here. Uh, and again, one of the, the really key places I think we're really collaborating is uh, we're trying to set up and, and finalize what we think we'll call the, uh, the objectives for Artemis, the science objectives for Artemis. And we really are leaning on our uh, science mission directorate colleagues, uh, Steve heavily there to, uh, to help us on that. And so as SMD pulls that information together, that's the type of goals that we can adopt within the overall Artemis program to, uh, to meet with our robotic and human exploration of the lunar surface. And I also, I just wanna call out again, Steve, Steve called it out, but we were planning the Lunar Surface Science Workshop at the end of April. And uh, for obvious reasons, um, that, that's not gonna be a, uh, a meeting that we can attend physically, uh, but we do wanna find ways 
to uh, to use examples like uh, this meeting right now to start to virtually engage uh, the external NASA community so we can really start to build this strategy for exploring the moon, learning from lunar orbit, how to prepare for going on to Mars. And so I think that's my last slide and um, I'll uh, join with uh, Lori and Steve and answer any questions that the community might have. Great, thank you, Jake. Um, I've got a couple of uh, announcements for folks that are online. Um, first, um, if you're watching the video and you're experiencing a blurry video, uh, check the HD button on the bottom right of the video box. Um, I'm told that if you check that and go to HD, it should hopefully make, the, make it a little clearer. Um, and then also just to remind folks that if you want to send your questions, send them to Doris Dow. Her email is Doris. D-O-R-I-S dot Dow, D-A-O-U, at NASA.gov. And we've got quite a few questions here um, already, so we'll start with some of these. And if it's okay with Steve and Jake, I'll just read them out and we'll uh, I'll try to moderate. Um, maybe we'll um, start with some here. I've got um, several for Steve. Um, Let's see, uh, let's start with some of these here about, uh, will there be a participating scientist call for the existing CLIPS missions for ABM-1 and for Gateway? So thank you, Lori. Uh, no, we don't have a plan to do participating scientist programs for the first two. Um, the main reason for that is uh, these first two, we wanted to jump start as soon as we could. And I started out with what I'd call somewhat of a limited budget in FY19, to do just that, to get, you know, we selected 12 instruments to um, the NASA provided lunar payloads to go into development and to fund two of our CLIPS providers. So we didn't really have much wiggle room when it came to budget. Um, and most of these are near ready to fly instruments, um, some of which may even be uh, engineering test units or prototypes. So we, we didn't consider it being a good opportunity to, to do the program uh, participating scientist program for those two. Um, certain now we are in discussions to see when we want to uh, bring those on. We may look at the uh, LCP instruments as a possibility, uh, but we just haven't really converged on an answer for that yet. Certainly for PRISM we will, and I think I briefed that in my charts, uh, but we are taking a look at the 19 C and D uh, LCP instruments to see if that would be of value to the community as well. Okay, and then there's another question here about the joint SMD, HOEMD, um, SDMD workshop, question about how to participate in that. Maybe this is for both Steve and Jake. I know you both said that uh, probably going to be postponed and maybe a different format, but how do folks uh, find out how to participate? So Jake, I'll, I guess I'll take that first if you want to amplify anything, uh, because I know you've been involved deeply with the details with, with Ben Bussey. Um, but we did put out a call to the community for abstracts. And we received, if, if I'm not mistaken, over 170 abstracts um, from across the science community. Um, and so that call is closed and we're focusing on those abstracts. And that's what we uh, were using to develop the workshop. Uh, it was going to be a three-day workshop. Um, so stay tuned. You know, once we start conducting those uh, hopefully virtual uh, subgroup meetings, and eventually we're going to come to a time where we get on the other side of the virus here, and hopefully can do a face-to-face -face, um, sometime in the in the late summer, early fall, if everything goes well. Um, then we'll have more to report out, but. Uh, Right now, you know, since we had that call and we had such a robust response with uh, the abstracts, um, right now that's where we're at. We're, we're not looking for any more input. Jake, do you want to amplify that? Yeah, uh, just to add a little bit to that, our organizing committee is uh, is going to be meeting shortly to, uh, to discuss the best path forward. Um, the abstracts that were submitted um, were, were great contributions. I think we're looking into options to go ahead and still put those online the same way that we would have had the meeting physically occurred at the end of April. Um, and then to build from that, uh, you know, it, these are unfortunate circumstances. We can't change them, uh, but we'll, we don't want to just cancel the meeting. And uh, we also don't want to just take it as it was proposed here and move it to a later date. So we want to look for pathways to uh, move forward 
again, engage virtually as, as we can. And so that when we get to an, uh, a time when we can have another meeting, we're, we're building on what we have been able to get done. So I think um, stay tuned and we will release announcements as to uh, virtual opportunities or other opportunities as we discuss that with our organizing committee. Okay, and Jake, while you're while you're on here, um, you know, Steve spoke to the possibilities of uh, participating scientist programs on some of his activities, but there was also a follow on here about Gateway. Do you know if there's any opportunity for a PSP associated with Gateway, Gateway Science? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I guess one thing I didn't go into a lot of detail about the the payloads that were um, announced for early flight with Gateway. Um, when I talk about Gateway, um, one of the complexities that I'd like everyone to understand is that um, when our, our timeline was moved to a 2024 landing, we basically put us in a position with Gateway where we had to develop research objectives uh, at the same time as trying to identify payloads at the same time as we're developing the spacecraft itself. And so we recognize that this is not the nominal way uh, that we approach uh, selecting and funding payloads. And we had to work um, very closely with our international partners to uh, identify what we thought were the highest priority measurements to be made early on at Gateway, understanding that Gateway is a platform to both support uh, exploration of the moon as well as prepare for uh, uh, traveling onto Mars and exploring Mars. Uh, so working with the international science community, we evaluated and identified um, high value in the orbit that Gateway's in, a near rectilinear halo orbit. Um, can, is there anything that you can bring to the table for us to fly here? And so because of the very compressed timeline that HEO was under, we recognized that wasn't the traditional pathway to, uh, to identify payloads. However, we have identified that partnership, um, including uh, science team membership um, across the supporting agencies was of high value. And so at the moment, um, I can't say exactly how we're going to go about approaching that, but I think just like everything else that we're doing right now, we're moving extremely fast and we are looking to SMD in a collaborative mode to try and identify ways to uh, make those opportunities available. So again, stay tuned um, and, and just please understand we're, we're moving quick and we're trying to, uh, to, trying to create the opportunity for these chances in the future for people to participate. Great, thanks, Jake. Um, all right, how about I take a couple and then we'll we'll throw a couple back to to you guys and and for folks online. I know there's some budget questions here, and I'll get to those in a minute. But I'm going to address some of these other other ones first. Um, here's one that says, uh, given the current situation, is Mars 2020 expected to be launched on time? And I'm glad you asked that question. Um, this is something that's been uh, right on the forefront of everybody's mind, uh, both the Mars 2020 project and at headquarters. Uh, we've put together a framework, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, um, with which to look at each of the missions um, and at what points uh, we want to continue working, uh, working on them. Uh, and Mars 2020 is uh, one, of, one of only two uh, missions that uh, within SMD that is, is the very highest priority that we are placing the launch, um, uh, the scheduled launch. Um, as a high priority that we're gonna ensure that we meet that launch window in July. In so doing that, we're also making sure that our personnel are healthy and safe. We're taking every precaution to make sure that those individuals that are working on, on Mars 2020 are going to, to uh, work in conditions and, and have an environment where they're able to, to stay safe. Um, but we're continuing the activities that are uh, the integration and test activities that are going on at Kennedy Space Center. We have full support from Kennedy and full support from, from JPL and NASA headquarters and from Department of Energy as well uh, for making sure we get the, um, the MMRTG um, delivered to Kennedy and installed. So um, as of right now, um, and even if we go to a, a next stage of alert, uh, Mars 2020 is moving forward on schedule and everything is, is so far uh, very well on track. Um, so stay tuned for that. But at this point, we don't see any impact um, due to the current situation. As I said, uh, we are making sure that all of our personnel that are working on 
March 2020 uh, are, are taking all precautions and make sure that their safety uh, is, is number one. Uh, so we are making sure that we do that as well. Um, I have a couple questions in here about the CATL survey that I'd like to address quickly. Um, there is a question here about regarding serving on the CATL survey committee, can I clarify what is meant by an active proponent of a specific project? And I think what this is referring to in my interpretation um, is, for example, someone who may have proposed a certain idea, for example, a New Frontiers concept previously, um, might be seen as someone who would be, uh, you know, uh, publicly acknowledge as someone who is an active proponent for a specific type of project, although they may not have been a PI on one of the current uh, mission concept studies and may or may not be a, a first author on a on a white paper. Uh, some in the community may feel that they have a, a vested interest in a particular concept. Um, that being said, uh, that will all be dis discussed and, and assessed by the National Academies as they're making their selections for the panels. Um, but in, in my interpretation, that's, uh, that's what that statement means. Uh, there was also another statement, another question here about the uh, white papers. Um, it says, looking at the uh, ag websites, the count for provisional white papers currently exceeds 200. Uh, would I like to encourage authors to converge and merge their papers to make the National Academy's review task more tractable? Um, so in response to that, I just want to to note that uh, every single white paper is important. Um, the, I can guarantee you, as someone who's been on the Decadal Survey in the past, that uh, the panel takes those white papers very seriously. They read every single one. Um, and so whether a, a paper has one co-signer or 200 co-signers, um, they're all important. They all have ideas that, that are carefully considered. That being said, um, you can imagine if you were a member on the panel, um, you know, you have a limited amount of energy to read those papers. And so to the extent that it's possible to uh, bring uh, members of the community together that have like-minded ideas and can come together uh, with uh, a paper with multiple co-signers, uh, you know, think about the, think about the energy of, of your panel members um, and trying to uh, make sure that they have the, the bandwidth to, to consider everything that, that we want to submit. Uh, but as I said, every single white paper is important, so um, I don't want to uh, in any way uh, artificially limit uh, the number of papers that get submitted. Um, I think that was the only other decadal one for now. Let's come back to Steve. There was a good question here about PRISM. Um, it says that the PRISM step one is an RFI to create a catalog, but then you also say that selected PRISM instruments will feed future CLIPS missions. And the question is, will individual instruments be funded from this PRISM step one call, or will only PI-led payloads in PRISM step two be funded for development? Um, thank you, Lori. That's a good question. Uh, no, we're looking for individual instruments as well. Um, and, and I apologize if the wording was a little confusing. Um, we are looking for suites of instruments so that we can uh, do more science on each of the deliveries uh, that we can do. But understanding that there are instruments that um, operate solely by themselves um, are of great interest as well. So we welcome uh, single instrument proposals as well. Great. All right, uh, let's come back to some of these budget questions. Um, so here's a question here, um, says, I'm super pleased that this is one of the strongest budgets in NASA's history, but I'd like to know more about the thinking behind decisions to fund a new Mars mission not advocated for by the community, um, for example, Ice Mapper, while two current Mars missions that got very highly reviewed in the recent extended mission proposal, Odyssey and Curiosity, have major budget cuts which seriously affect their ability to complete the activities in their extended mission proposal. Um, and then essentially saying Odyssey uh, appears to be effectively canceled and Curiosity cut um, in 21 and 22. So I, I do want to address this one head on. Um, again, as I said in the beginning, please keep in mind those are proposed budgets. Um, and the exercise that, uh, that we go through to, to work with OMB to put those together, um, we, we pull and, and try and, and fit things as best we can um, inside the budgets that we have available. Um, as you noted, uh, Odyssey and Curiosity both performed very well uh, in the, in the uh, extended mission uh, senior review. 
um, they've done very well. Um, and certainly uh, we have desire to, to keep them going as, as long as possible. Um, as I said, uh, the, the budget that we have now is a, is a proposal and we're working to, to try and find a way to keep um, all of our operating missions um, that are successful, keep them all going as long as possible. Um, so at this point, uh, we are, you know, with the, the budget as it looks, with Odyssey, uh, the funding that's there, we do have to start thinking about what it would take uh, to close it down, but we're, we're trying to move that at a pace that would allow us flexibility um, should the case arise that we're able to uh, secure additional funding um, to keep it going. Um, so I do understand the value of the, the existing missions. We certainly want to keep them all going. Um, I'll talk just a moment about Ice Mapper. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, this is a mission that uh, right now uh, in the proposed budget is a study. It is a study to look at a potential concept uh, that uh, would contribute to science at Mars with understanding the distribution and concentration of ice um, in the Martian regolith. Um, in addition to that, uh, and, and to do that, actually, to, to do that um, mapping of the ice uh, is, again, leverage international partnerships. We have the potential uh, for a collaboration uh, with Canada and a Canadian uh, synthetic aperture radar. Um, and so that's what provides, in some sense, this opportunity. And again, the idea would be to study a concept that would significantly leverage those international and potentially even commercial partnerships um, to uh, not only do the science, but also provide uh, additional communications infrastructure that's going to be needed in the coming decade uh, once uh, we start flying Mars sample return, and, uh, and then also to start uh, preparations, um, gathering the needed data as uh, we start to think about going forward with um, human exploration in the next decade. Um, so I think hopefully that addresses that question. There was another question. Uh, that was very similar to that one. So hopefully that answers both of those. Uh, there was a question. This is a simple one. Um, let us know where we could download the slides from this week's virtual town halls. These can be found on the NASA Solar System website. It's science.nasa.gov slash solar dash system slash documents. Um, so all of the slides are going to be posted there. You can find them from all of the town halls that have happened this week. Um, let's see, here's a question uh, for planning purposes. Uh, can you give a ballpark target cost cap for the next simplex opportunity, knowing that it is dependent on the budget, plus or minus 25 million would be helpful. Um, as of today, looking forward, uh, we don't foresee changing the cost cap. The cost cap that uh, was in the last round of simplex was 55 million. And uh, we currently uh, are targeting uh, that same uh, same general ballpark for for a, a cost cap for simplex. Um, we were uh, at the time when that uh, call went out the last time. We're not totally confident what kind of science we would get back within that cost cap, but we're really impressed with the uh, quality of the science and the level of maturity of the designs that came in. Um, and so we're. We're really, uh, as I said, impressed with the, the level of science that could be fit into that $55 million cost cap. So for now, uh, the expectation is that it would remain the same. Um, again, these are questions that going into the next decadal survey are, are things that I really encourage uh, the survey to consider. Uh, what is the appropriate scope for simplex and for discovery and new frontiers and, the, and how do we blend all of those together and the right cadences for each of those uh, that can fit within the budget that we have available? Let's see, some other questions. Ah, here's a good question. Uh, the schedule for implementing Science Mission Directorate's strategic social media plan uh, that will consolidate all existing profiles from its missions. Uh, is SMD reaching out to all of the missions to get their feedback on this plan before implementation? So this is a really interesting question. It's probably not something that everyone is familiar with, uh, but over you know the last, uh, you know, a couple of decades as the way we communicate has evolved, uh, you know, first from traditional uh, uh, types of, of media through the internet and Facebook pages and now through social media with uh, uh, Twitter and Instagram and other similar uh, platforms, uh, the way we communicate has changed. And uh, uh, it's in the past, NASA's kind of taken an organic approach where, where everyone has had their own individual um, accounts. 
And what we found is that to have the most impact uh, in this environment, uh, it's actually uh, much more impactful to have large thematic accounts from which uh, many of our missions or projects can, um, can communicate to, to the public. Um, through these larger thematic accounts. Um, this is not something that planetary science or even science mission directorate is doing um, independently. This is actually something that's agency-wide um, uh, activity uh, moving forward. Um, so this is, uh, this is coming and we are communicating with the teams to let them know this is happening. Um, we're having, uh, in fact, I have conversations, I believe even this week with a couple of the teams uh, to, to talk about how this is going to be implemented, but the intent uh, is always to make sure that our information is reaching the broadest audience possible. Uh, we're trying to help, uh, uh, again, get that information out, get the science out, and, and, and engage as much of the, uh, the public as we can. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Let's see, see what else we have. Um, here's a question from the Planetary Society that I think is for all three of us. It says, all of us at the Planetary Society are happy to see that the Decadal Survey's focus includes astrobiology and planetary defense. Uh, it says, can Lori and the other panelists say more in this forum about how NASA is embracing this direction? Um, so I'll, I'll just give a little bit first and then see if Steve or, or Jake would like to comment on any aspect of, of what went into the direction for the Cato survey. Um, as we went into developing the statement of task for the, the Cato survey, uh, it was really important to me and to, to actually all of um, planetary science and to Thomas Zerbukin as well, that we make sure that um, these key uh, parts of our program, astrobiology and planetary defense, um, are included um, as part of the discussion for Decadal Survey. They're both critical parts um, of what the agency does and the parts of our portfolio within planetary science. And in thinking about astrobiology, there have been a couple of different ways to uh, consider astrobiology in planetary science. And one is to think of it as a separate entity in and of itself and think about astrobiology and planetary science independently. But I think there's an enormous amount of value to think about astrobiology in a much broader sense, um, and even broader than just planetary science, but even across all of science at NASA. And so we felt it was really critically important that um, astrobiology be called out explicitly and that it be considered as part of the larger, broader questions uh, within uh, the planetary sciences uh, division's uh, purview. And the same goes for planetary defense. Uh, planetary defense is a critical part of, of our program. Uh, it's uh, a really essential function for, uh, for our country and for the world that we are uh, coordinating and working with other partners to identify and characterize uh, near Earth objects and potentially hazardous asteroids, developing mitigation techniques for potential um, future asteroid threats, um, and this is something that I think Planetary Science Division is uniquely positioned to do this work. Uh, we have the science expertise within uh, planetary science community, not only to understand the science of these bodies, but to understand their orbits, to understand their uh, compositions, to understand um, their physical makeup, um, all of that information. We have the scientific expertise we also have the engineering expertise to understand how you might go about designing and building and implementing a mission that could be uh, uh, launched uh, in order to mitigate potential threat. Um, and so I think this is a really fundamental part of our program, uh, not just the science, but the, uh, the protecting uh, and preserving life on Earth aspect of our charge um, at NASA. So uh, to me, it was incredibly important, again, that that planetary defense be included uh, for the decadal survey's iteration. Um, so I don't know if Steve, you have um, anything you'd like to talk about, um, maybe in particular, the emphasis that's called out for um, working with uh, uh, human exploration to understand uh, how we can better uh, enable science through human exploration. That is also, of course, called out in the state mass. Yeah, Lori, I think you did a great job um, really laying that out. And I, I don't have a whole lot more to add, but um, the key there is what you just pointed out is we continue to work very closely with our, HEO, um, our human exploration uh, colleagues in, in both those areas. And certainly if we leverage 
um, for instance, future CLIPS missions um, to help enable um, those communities to meet their objectives um, from a science standpoint, then we're, we're certainly open to doing that. Um, I can think on, on the planetary defense side, I know from a space situational awareness back, um, there is a lot of interest in potentially using um, CLIPS to provide new vantage points uh, for that space situational awareness. So we are in active talks now. Um, and then on the astrobiology side, you know, we've had some initial discussions and Jake can probably amplify it too with, with folks in um, the space life, space life sciences area. Uh, there seems to be some interest there to fly um, some future payloads on CLIPS missions as well. And so we're, we're actively exploring those options with our mission directorate colleagues. Jake, you wanna add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can just echo everything that's been said so far. Uh, from our perspective, it's a, it's a great opportunity to have uh, considerations wrapped into the decadal. Uh, you know, Steve mentioned using CLIPS to provide unique uh, new vantage points from which to make observations. Uh, we view the human exploration architecture the same way. Uh, we need to work closely with SMD moving forward. Uh, the, the spacecraft that we're developing and will fly will provide those unique opportunities from which to make observations. For instance, the gateway enabling us to put out uh, payloads from ESA to monitor weather as well as, um, as the heliophysics uh, payload that SMD is gonna fly. So I think uh, having having this relationship, we will look to your decadal survey. We will look to the SMD community to tell us what are the important science observations that need to be made. And then our job makes sure that we develop our architecture in a way that enables as much of that as we can accomplish. Great, thank you. Thanks both. Um, there were a couple follow-on questions, um, Steve and Jake, regarding the workshop. Um, there was one question saying, where was the, the call for abstract for abstracts? Um, was it an email list or through Inspire? So I guess some people missed that. So just wondering where they should be looking. And then another one saying that they would have submitted an abstract, uh, but the dates didn't work for them. But now that it may be postponed or virtual, um, they'd definitely be interested. So would you consider another opportunity for abstracts to be considered? So I know, I know Jake, um, if I, I know from uh, talking with Ben Bussey, that um, numerous listservs that reached across all the communities was used, I think, from a really broad uh, blast out for abstracts, and maybe you can provide some details there. Um, on the second question, um, certainly with the current environment, um, we do want to move forward, as Jake said, um, but we certainly can consider um, whether or not it would be a benefit to, to open it up um, another call for abstracts. Uh, but right now, we just can't make that determination. We've got to see really how the abstracts we did, how how we're going to put those in different categories and how we're going to move forward. Um, but Jake, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, see if you got some additional information on both parts of that question. Uh, yeah, so um, for the workshop itself, we worked closely with uh, the Lunar and Planetary Institute, as well as um, SERVI, some Exploration Research Virtual Institute. Uh, to organize that, and I believe the initial announcement was organized by the LPI, and then it went out through a series of listservs um, that were uh, basically the same listservs we used for the prior uh, SMD HOMD joint workshop, which was a workshop on Gateway and early teen uh, science at the Gateway. Uh, so, you know, prominently for the lunar community, that announcement was made out through the lunar list uh, serve. So, I would say that if you missed the the announcement um that you probably want to maybe look to one of those um lists to uh to opportunities as they're coming forward i know there were a few things i saw trickling out on social media as well so um if you didn't hear about it um we apologize for that in uh but but maybe try to monitor some of those and um i i um thank you for the question about uh will there be an opportunity to submit a distract I hadn't really thought about that at this point, but um, again, I'll stress the point that we're moving very rapidly to try to meet the goals that have been presented to us, uh, landing uh, crew on the surface of the moon uh, and exploration from lunar orbit. And so uh, as we 
you know, kind of missing this physical opportunity for a meeting at the end of April. And as we look at opportunities to do some virtual activities there, maybe we need to explore opportunities to uh, to uh, encourage additional abstract submissions. And uh, again, by moving quickly, we we know things change rapidly. So continuing continuing just the architecture with the community uh, might result in uh, different inputs where we to ask for abstracts. So. Again, thanks for that question, uh, and and I'll just reiterate that the organizing committee is going to be getting together over the next few weeks to discuss this, and uh, we'll certainly take that uh, input into consideration. Great. Um, here's a perhaps a quick one uh, for you, Steve. Uh, will Prism have a website? Having trouble finding the unmute. Uh, but there, <laughs> um, yes, actually we will. And that's in uh, development and right now. Uh, we're working office, um, Brad Bailey is uh, leading that up. And so we will have a website for PRISM. I don't have a projected date, but uh, yes, the answer is yes. Good. Okay, uh, here's a question uh, that's uh, nominally for me, but I may have to phone a friend on this one. It says, should we anticipate elections for March 2020 participating scientists will be made before launch in July, or should we expect delays? Um, and so I believe that that uh, program is going forward, um, you know, as scheduled, um, but I'm not exactly sure when the anticipated announcements are expected. Um, so if Reinhardt or uh, Michael Meyer um, are listening or uh, or Mitch Schulte, maybe they can uh, either text me or send a note to Doris and communicate to me so I can uh, tell folks uh, uh, what uh, what to expect there. That would be helpful. Um, so I'll try and get that. If I don't get that information and, and try and communicate it out uh, as we get it. That's a good question. Um, as far as I know, things are on schedule. Um, Steve, here's another one for you. Um, you mentioned Trailblazer briefly, but uh, didn't get back to it unless uh, unless the listener missed it. So can you speak a little bit more about Lunar Trail? Yeah, and actually, I think um, in the development of these slides, and we were concerned about time, I think I had one slide in there, and in the final version, it's not. And so uh, um, as as Lori knows, it's going uh, Trailblazer is going through phase A, B right now, um, and we are in discussions with Lori. Indeed, if they make it through the phase B um, decision point, then um, we will fund it in LDEP. Um, and we're very excited about that, about that uh, project. Uh, we see great benefit to do more with smaller platforms. Um, and this was one of the ones Lori mentioned in her part of the talk that was uh, came through Simplex. Um, we certainly look forward to additional uh, proposals that could come through Simplex that focuses on Lunar because we'd be very excited about uh, looking at those as well. Um, but Trailblazer is moving through the phase AB um, study. Um, they're doing very well. And so later this year, we look forward to evaluating um, whether or not they'll go into the um, confirmation at PDR. So um, unless there are some further questions on that, um, that's really the gist of where they're at right now. Cool. Yeah, we're all excited about Lunar. I was really excited that uh, that Steve and, and his uh, group were, were also uh, interested in Trailblazer. So the the fact that we have multiple groups uh, and organizations at headquarters interested in our simplexes has allowed us to to actually expand our 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 phase A B portfolio to give ourselves the best uh, for success, hopefully in, in simplex. Um, let's see. Uh, Here's a really interesting question. Um, says, would NASA consider transferring or selling Odyssey to another governmental agency, a private company or nonprofit, et cetera? Um, and that's an interesting question. We'll have to, uh, have to, to give people a call back on that one. Um, I would have to go back and do a little bit of research on uh, legalities um, to understand what, the, what the, the possibilities might be. I honestly... Um, and hadn't, hadn't thought of that question before. So we'll have to, I can go back and, and do see what, what practicalities are there. Um, it might be interesting to know what exactly one person might have in mind with that question. Um, and with that, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, 
Remember, if you have questions, please, please uh, email them to doris.dow at nasa.gov, D-O-R-I-S dot D-A-O-U at nasa.gov. Um, if you've got any more questions, and she can uh, submit those. I think I've answered all of the ones that have come in that uh, Steve or Jake or I have answered them all. Um, while we're giving people a moment to see if they want to send another uh, Jen, I just want to take a moment again to thank LPI for hosting this event. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, and for the person who asked the question about the Mars 2020 uh, participating scientist program, I got uh, an answer back on that one. Um, had we been at LPSC on the floor, I would have just handed over to Michael Meyer to answer, the, answer this question, uh, since he's the knowledgeable one on this topic. He says the review uh, is scheduled on time uh, for the short term. All reviews will be done remotely, so um, it will happen one way or another is what he says. So uh, the expectation is that, um, as I indicated earlier, um, all of our uh, panels have gone virtual. Uh, they uh, may, uh, we maybe have to take a couple extra days and run them a little differently than we normally do on a face-to-face -face panel, but the expectation is we're gonna try to, uh, to keep things on schedule as best um, as we can. Um, um, <laughs> Here's a, a comment from someone uh, that was submitted saying, we miss the tension in the room of the usual LPSC NASA headquarters briefing. Uh, yes, me too. I, I definitely miss that. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, no, this is this has been nice. Uh, anyway, uh, this is making a comment. Is, uh, Nice to say that it's refreshing to watch public servants engage so directly. Um, and so we will stay safe. You stay safe as well, um, all of you. Um, okay. Um, here we go. Uh, I did get a little bit of an answer back on the spacecraft prior uh, attempt to transfer a spacecraft over to another entity uh, was told by the lawyers that it couldn't be done, but that doesn't mean we won't ask the question again. Um, and then there's a question about uh, PSD. Uh, why does PSD conduct senior reviews of ongoing missions? Uh, results are ignored in budget decisions. I think that's a, a fairly uh, abrupt question, but uh, the the point is, whenever we do our senior reviews, um, we are looking for trying to best understand what the scientific return is from those missions, and the senior review provides that. Um, but there's also always the uh, additional catches funding availability. Um, and so, you know, we're working really hard to budget the, you know, balance the budget that we have. Um, and um, sometimes tough decisions need to be made. As I said earlier, we're trying to, as best we can, adhere to the recommendations. Um, the highest uh, ranking uh, missions are uh, um, and going forward. And we hope to, to keep all of the operating missions going um, as best we can. Um, let's see, uh, here's another question. Will the success of the three currently selected simplex missions have any effect on the number selected for the next round of simplex? That is yes, because we have one simplex line um, and it has a fixed amount of funding in it. Um, that being said, um, as I um, indicated earlier, we're really pleased that there are other organizations that were interested in the three simplexes that were uh, successful, that went on to phase A, B. And as Steve indicated, Lunar Trailblazer, if they uh, are successful uh, in reaching uh, their phase C, their confirmation, uh, the Lunar Discovery Exploration Program is going to take uh, Lunar Trailblazer on, um, take over the funding for that one, which um, again would, uh, would not be uh, funded out of the um, and likewise, uh, Escapade, we have a lot of interest from the heliophysics division. So there is a potential if uh, Escapade does well and makes it into phase C, path confirmation, there's a potential that, um, that that one may be funded outside of the simplex line as well. So yes, there is a uh, correlated, um, there is a fixed amount of funding in the simplex line. Um, so we can only support uh, so much uh, there, but, um, but as I said, I think uh, there are opportunities to, to really make sure that these uh, interesting missions uh, have a way forward uh, if, they, if they demonstrate their capability uh, to, um, and then hopefully, uh, again, we have the ability to uh, offer another round uh, to bring in um, some additional um, concepts. 
Um, let's see, here's another question. Want to ask, is there any special mission to filter lunar dust? And I don't know if that's okay. Well, I can at least say from uh, from Hugh's perspective that there are a number of uh, thoughts and uh, aspects of how we're um, thinking about dust right now. Um, it certainly is a uh, topic that we discuss and when it, it may be transferred from the human lander to the gateway to Orion, how do we need to filter it? How do we monitor it? Uh, those are open topics of discussion. I will bring up our partnership with uh, STMD uh, with respect to any kinds of that we can conduct now with simulants to study regolith and how it will affect the systems that we're developing. Um, as for specific missions to land on the surface and conduct some form of filtering of the regolith, I don't know of anything currently um in the that we are looking at how uh regolith uh reacts to landers uh to the rockets and everything like that uh to assess how and how we need to space landing where how far away do we need to be from already deployed payloads uh topics like that so there are a number of things in consideration and about studying regolith uh moving forward and i don't know steve if you have anything else to add to that um, I don't have the specifics, but we do have one of the LSIT P instruments that's focusing on the regolith and dust environment um, that we're going to be flying um, on one of the deliveries in 2022. So I don't have the information handy to look up the, the aspects of that particular instrument, but um, yeah, we are going to have some initial uh, data in the 2022 timeframe when we deliver, or when our CLIPS provider delivers for us, I should say. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, here's another interesting question. Uh, if a private company were to launch a space-based solar system telescope, would SMD be potentially interested in data buys for RNA? Um, and that is a really great question. Um, we're really looking at a variety of different types of partnered ways to work with uh, the commercial um, commercial community in a variety of different ways. The CLIPS is, is one approach that we're taking uh, where we're buying services from these uh, commercial providers for uh, landers to the surface of the moon. Uh, but in earth science, they're already um, experimenting with um, these type, types of um, activities. Um, and so this is certainly something that is, is interesting to pursue. We're watching very closely to see how the um, the data buy activity in earth science is going uh, to make sure we learn some lessons from there to understand how we can potentially uh, participate in, in cemetery science. Uh, it's, it's interesting to, to hear that there are commercial interests um, in flying some planetary missions uh, for telescopes or I've heard other ideas uh, for other commercial uh, ventures that may be able to provide services or data to planetary science and uh, we're interested in doing the science and so if there's a good mechanism to help provide additional data for doing science um, we're interested uh, we just need to work through whatever's the right uh, the right mechanism to to do that thanks for that question that was good um, here's another good question um, any word on whether the new frontiers target list will come out of the decadal or caps uh, both times in talks but i'm not sure how widely it's been disseminated uh, but the uh, CAPS, which is our National Academies uh, Committee, the Standing Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Science, um, has been tasked specifically to uh, look at the, um, the list of uh, New Frontiers Tarm. And they have a meeting coming up at the end of this month, month uh, March 31st and I think April 1st and 2nd. Uh, they, it has just been uh, transitioned to be a virtual meeting. Uh, but there should be information out there if people want to dial in and listen. Um, and what they're going to be focused on in that discussion is primarily, uh, for example, uh, the uh, you know, Trojan tour. Uh, I've gotten lots of questions. Is Trojan tour going to be offered? We have a mission in discovery, which is uh, meeting many of the objectives, um, if not all of those objectives of Trojan tour. Uh, so should that one still be included? Um, also, um, Ocean Worlds and thinking about uh, the last time when that was offered. Uh, number one, Ocean Worlds uh, was something that at the time it was put into New Frontiers, 
uh, CAPS didn't have the ability to uh, provide a recommendation back. They now have the ability to do letter reports on these type of uh, questions. So it allows the world to understand whether now that uh, Dragonfly has been selected uh, to provide uh, some input regarding whether or not Ocean Worlds that has been satisfied or whether Enceladus should remain um, in the list um, or you know the Ocean Worlds topic in general. Um, and uh, they're not, they've not been asked to ask, so don't worry about them adding new targets. We are asking them to look at um, those that are there. We've also asked them to just reaffirm uh, that the Io Volcano Observatory and Lunar Geophysical Network um, should be added as recommended uh, by the uh, original decadal survey. So they are um, definitely tasked to, to have uh, some good uh, guidance uh, and recommendations coming out of CAPS uh, at the end of this month that will help us uh, formulate uh, what, what that next New Frontiers call is going to look like. Uh, let's see, there was a question. Please repeat where the slides are going to be posted. And that is the uh, solar system, uh, science.nasa.gov slash solar dash system slash documents. Um, and then there's a question about, uh, will there be a video posted of this town hall? And that will be a question uh, for Myra. Uh, if she wants to uh, send me the information on whether or not that's going to be available. She's supporting this, um, this town hall. So hopefully I'll get some information from her on what, uh, what might, may or may not be available following. And let's see, uh, here's a question. I heard that the cost cap for the next simplex missions will remain at 55. I uh, may have missed an announcement. So there hasn't been an announcement, but I did mention uh, the expectation is that the cost cap for simplex um, there's no expectation it's going to change. And last time it was $55 million. Um, at this point, there's no, uh, no intention to, uh, to change that. And let's see, do you expect the current COVID-19 schedule for the Simplex AO release or other upcoming ongoing opportunities? Uh, for example, Discovery Phase A, New Frontiers 5 AO, et cetera. Ideally, what is the current target for release of the Simplex AO? As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are looking to make sure we are gathering as much lessons learned as we can from the current, uh, the, right now the no earlier than date for Simplex is September of 2020. Um, at this point, I, I don't see COVID-19 being a primary driver of when that AO comes out. I think uh, it's more making sure that we have uh, uh, everything lined up going on with the current set of Simplex and understanding the budget going forward um, is going to be the primary driver for when that AO comes out and understanding what the opportunities are for ride shares, um, that if there are additional ride share opportunities that we can offer. So we're trying to assess all of those things right now. And those are bigger drivers than COVID-19 right now as far as simplex. Uh, discovery phase A's. Um, we are trying to make sure we assess uh, what the impacts are on all the teams um, across all of the activities that we have going on um, right now. Uh, you know, all, all of our activities at the NASA centers are being done uh, almost exclusively through virtual. Everyone is teleworking. Um, that may or may not, depending on the uh, duration of, of this uh, impact, uh, you know, may or may not uh, drive a need for, for some kind of adjustment to the phase A studies. For right now, uh, we're looking at the near-term impacts, um, things like our review panels, uh, lines um, that are coming up over the next uh, month or two. Uh, right now, um, the concept study reports are due um, right around Thanksgiving. Um, and at this point, uh, we're, we haven't addressed that yet, but we will continue to keep an eye on, on how those teams are doing. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a question. STMD is planning on having a funded program called Luster Lunar Surface Technology Research coming out in June timeframe. How can the science community find out about this one? Maybe that's for Steve. Yeah, so we work closely with STMD, and we will ensure that um, all these are aware of that through the various contact points, the list serves, and so forth like that. So, um, yes, we'll definitely make sure that uh, there is a broad notification uh, for that uh, particular call. Great. Okay, I'm uh, not seeing any more questions right now. Um, so maybe we should begin to, to wrap this up. 
Um, again, I wanted to thank uh, both Steve and, and Jake uh, for being here with me today. Uh, it's important that we're all, we're all working this together, uh, not just the, the planetary science and the importance of, of Moon to Mars um, and our, our collaborations with human exploration, uh, but we're all working together, uh, trying to do everything virtually. So uh, we thank everybody for your patience and for, uh, for your uh, remote participation today. And again, thanks to LPI for, for their support. We appreciate it. Uh, I think we're going to wind it up. Um, thank you very much. And for Steve and Jake, why don't we just hold for a moment uh, until we get the all clear. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Lori.